Karatizmata Daimon and welcome to Daimonosophy. This is a response and a unpacking resulting from a recent short that I made regarding the Bhagavad Gita and the idea that one of the interpretations of certain passages from the Gita leads one to the conclusion that it is not possible to exist in this world without destroying other forms of organic life, that that is part of the law of existence in uh, the world on planet Earth, that to exist here as an organic being, you must destroy other organic beings. Um, you must consume or other organic beings. Um, so there was a response on here from uh, Dreamland Mavu, who said, mashing up an apathetic law from mindfulness and the Bhagavad Gita is a gross misinterpretation. So my first response to this is that um, there is no universally true and accurate interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita or really any of the super texts like uh, the Gospels or Secret of the Golden Flower and other things like that. Um, there is only the interpretation and the understanding of the one who attempts to absorb or read such documents or study them uh, within themselves. So um, really e everyone should you know, take up the, the Gita and uh, study it for themselves and find their own meaning of it. That's the uh, best possible uh, result. Um, however, of course, not everyone in the world is going to do that. Only those who are drawn to it for whatever reason will, as is the same for any of the other super texts. And for some others who have taken them up, they find within themselves the desire to try and articulate their understanding of it because by articulating and attempting to articulate, one learns more about the subject at hand. One uh, gains yet a further perspective on it. So there is value in the articulation beyond being a, uh, beyond producing a right and truthful and fully accurate interpretation for anyone else who might read it. So, so that's my first uh, suggestion to Dreamland Mavu. Um, you know, here, here's to you. I'm glad that you have uh, an interpretation. I don't know exactly what it is because um, all you did is tell me that mine is wrong but that's okay, I understand. Um, there's a short responses on a forum, so um, I appreciate hearing back from you on this because it's given me an opportunity to think more about it. That all being said, now uh, point number two that I would make is that I don't think it was a misinterpretation in my view, obviously, um, it was not a gross misinterpretation. However, um, I'm more than happy to dive a little deeper into the Gita itself and, and unpack why, um, why I might have presented the interpretation that I did. So I'll share with you some lines from it here. These are from uh, chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita, where most of this comes from. 
So Krishna says, the material body of the indestructible, immeasurable, and eternal living entity is sure to come to an end. Therefore, fight, O descendant of Bharata. So this is Krishna responding to Arjuna after Arjuna has um, a breakdown on the battlefield of uh, Kushetra and says he doesn't want to go to war. He doesn't want to slay his kinsmen. He thinks it's wrong. He's just going to lay down his bow and he's not going to fire it. So Krishna, now taking this opportunity to reveal his teaching to Arjuna, um, has begun thus. The first point he makes is to understand the material body of the indestructible, immeasurable, and eternal living entity is sure to come to an end. Therefore, fight our descendants of Bharata. In other words, the material body of the material bodies of the opposing soldiers be they your friends, family, or whatever, um, they're all going to die anyhow. Everyone is going to die and experience suffering anyhow. So that's the first point. You're not saving anyone by not destroying them because in the great scope of time, everyone is due to end anyhow. He continues, Neither he who thinks the living entity the slayer, nor he who thinks it slain, is in knowledge. For the self slays not, nor is slain. So here he's talking about not the physical entity. He's talking about the, the living aspect of our being, the spiritual aspect of our being, the non-material aspect of our being, the part of us that is not the apparent body, is not a slayer, nor is it slain. Um, it doesn't kill people, it doesn't kill other organic, entities, other organic life forms, uh, nor does it itself die. For the soul, there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being, and will not come into being. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. So this addresses not only birth and death, but the idea of growth or coming into being, um, appearing in being, is not something that happens to the divine aspect of ourselves. The divine aspect of ourselves always was, always is, and always shall be. Yeah, now, the caveat uh, is in greater or lesser um, awareness of that because our awareness, our consciousness, our attention in life ends up uh, becoming enmeshed in that outer part uh, of us within uh, the material body, the physical uh, brain and, and, and such what. And so um, that part will die and go away but that part is only the um, outer body and the inner part exists forever. O Partha, how can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and immutable kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? So the external part may destroy other things for it it must in order to exist but the inner part 
the eternal part, the divine part, is not able to kill anyone or cause anyone else to kill. For it is whole and complete within itself. As a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. The material body is like an outer coating for the inner immortal aspect of our existence. And it, it changes, we lose, it changes, first of all, throughout our lives. We always like to take these, uh, these words as uh, referring to the idea of reincarnation. It comes, it comes, the soul comes back and takes a new body. That body dies and then the soul comes back, takes another body. So um, that's certainly one way of looking at it. And that is one possible interpretation Another way of looking at it is how that the material body effectively um, dies and changes throughout our life um, at a cellular level. Um, science and medicine tell us that every cell within the body that makes up your physical body uh, within a 24 or 48 hour period has died and been replaced by another one. So really, materially, day by day, you are uh, physically a different person. Um, and it's just as much your divine consciousness that gives you the sense of being the same entity day by day as much as your, as much as your body does. On another level, this can refer to the idea of the different personalities or multiple eyes that, um, that we are in possession of. Um, why um, it, it says in the New Testament, my name is, is Legion of the man who is possessed by demons. Uh, my name is Legion for we are many. Um, I must call myself we for we are many. We are multiple uh, personalities that shift day by day based on uh, whim, circumstance, happenstance. And in that sense, as every new personality, which does manifest through my physical presence um, in the world in order to interact with the universe, um, it is I, I, the real me who is behind all that, the real permanent I, the real essence of our being does return through different selves just in the course of a day, but in the course of a few hours, can return through multiple selves. So this idea of uh, as a person puts on new garments, giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. So this is where they use the analogy of putting on different clothes, putting on different suits which we all just know on a very basic, simple, intuitive level that we change our outward appearance uh, based on need and circumstance. Yet within somewhere, there's something which maintains a continuity of our existence, a consistency of um, our existence. And that is the divine aspect within us. He says, the soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapon, nor burned by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. For these are all aspects of earth, aspects of the planet, aspects that interact with the planetary body. For the planetary body is made of the same substance as these things of earth earth, wind, and fire, whereas the 
divine nature is made of a different quality of substance. It is composed of substances uh, from a cosmic level, from a higher level. Therefore, it is not subject to being cut to pieces by any of the things of earth. One who has taken his birth is sure to die, and after death, one is sure to take birth again. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. And here he is talking about that to take birth means birth into the planetary world, into the material world, or the world of gross material, you might say. For there is a materiality to the divine as well, but of a much finer quality. So sometimes it's easier to just conceive of it as non-material and the earthly world around us uh, to be as material. But that birth and death are an assurance in the world of material. The world that Gurdjieff calls Do 48. World 48. There are we are subject to 48 laws. That birth is most assuredly to precede death. And in turn, that death is most assuredly to follow birth. Death must occur before birth, in fact. And um, this, this is the one thing that in the ordinary world of knowledge, the world of the rational mind, um, we have trouble thinking of it in that way. We like to think of birth at the beginning and then death at the end. Birth precedes death. But as you begin to ponder much of this esoteric material, and it appears numerous times in uh, the Gospels, like in, in Corinthians, when Paul is talking about um, the nature of the seed, and he says the seed must die so that it can be born. Um, it, 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 it appears again and again. And this is one of the, the, the initial truths that we must ponder when approaching this question of a higher conscious existence is that death precedes birth just as birth precedes death and birth and death and birth and death. We must die to our old selves, the old personalities must die so that uh, new awareness can emerge. There's uh, numerous levels on which this uh, pattern takes place. And w one of the important ones that certainly Krishna is making here and explaining this to uh, Arjuna is to help him understand that it isn't the real him, the real permanent I of his existence that is carrying out his duty to the planetary world of having to destroy other beings. It is really, um, it, it, it just is, it is simply his material aspect that does this. It is the clothes that he has put on that he must wear as a part of his existence here. O descendant of Virata, he who dwells in the body can never be slain. Therefore, you need not grieve for any living being. So no, the real self, the real spiritual nature, the energy nature, the life force energy of all organic beings, which flows through all organic beings, is not destroyed by the destruction of their material or apparent existence. And yet your duty 
obligates you to destroy it. And so this is where he says uh, to um, Arjuna, who is, again, Arjuna is a member of the Kshatriya caste or class, which is the warrior class, which his duty or Dharma, which is a concept similar to fate or weird or uh, Gurdjieff's park dog duty, um, is that he destroys other human beings in order to protect others, um, destroys the, uh, the uh, evil, the attacking, in order to you know, defend the uh, defenseless and the deserving. So Krishna says to him, considering your specific duty as a Kshatriya, you should know that there's no better engagement for you than fighting on religious principles. And so there is no need for hesitation. If, however, you do not perform this religious duty of fighting, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duties and thus lose your reputation as a fighter. So, this is one area where I think um, people go in some different directions in interpreting the Bhagavad Gita, specifically about the caste system. Some people take uh, that it's, it's literal and, and um, it's a, a form of uh, classism and, and endorses uh, slavery and that's part of the old uh, you know, patriarchal aspect of the uh, Bhagavad Gita that we need to kind of like look around it. Um, and then another way of interpreting it is that um, it's not really to be taken uh, entirely literally, but that he's also talking specifically about duty and that the Kshatriya duty of having to destroy other organic beings is, um, is a, a really great illustration of the extreme nature of having to follow Dharma. In other words, following Dharma, following one's duty or becoming aware of one's duty isn't just a matter of, you know, withdrawing from life. A lot of people think of it like that. A lot of people think of any kind of like uh, spiritual or conscious pursuit as, oh, I'm just going to withdraw from the world and avoid it. It's the idea of monastic isolation. But very much the nature of, of the Bhagavad Gita, and he talks about this more um, in, in that chapter on, on renunciation, that, that the way uh, toward enlightenment is not to renounce life entirely, um, but to renounce one's attachments to the results of it. And in many ways, this uh, initial, initial discussion of it here is a drill down to that idea, taking the extreme example of a Kshatriya or a warrior class that you would think, well, if I'm going to pursue like spiritual enlightenment, I can't like, you know, stay in the army. You know, you know anyone who's in the armed services today um, should should be able to uh, quickly identify with the um, with the paradigm of the uh, Kshatriya class that's being explored here. To do one's duty, one must be prepared to kill people, and in many cases, you do have to like go and destroy other people. Specifically, with that, um, so in the greater sense of understanding um, the caste system is that. All of us experience all castes. In one sense, all of the castes, just uh, the four castes, uh, just represent um, different aspects of uh, personalities. So, you know, we have a, a, a religious, uh, want to be pious personality. We have the warrior personality who has to, you know, go out there and have conflicts uh, with with people in the world. We have the uh, merchant class and professional class personality um, where we focus on, you know, honing our, our skills and, and, and being a householder. And we also have our, um, our you know, worker 
uh, personality where we, you know, drill down and, and just get busy with things. So it's another way of understanding it is the caste system is that every um, divine individual, divine essential being has this outer veneer of multiple personalities and goes through all of like the different castes. Um, and, 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 it, and again, you could take that to the level of reincarnation because that's the other idea is people like come back um, in, in, with reincarnation every time you come back to this world. Um, you can you know, progress through the caste system you know, from the bottom up to it or eventually you, you know, start out as a lowly worker and eventually you come back as a Brahmin. Again, you can take that within the law of eternal recurrence within um, the, just the unit of one's individual life that just in my own life I come back as as different castes. And he's using that extreme example of a Kshatriya because that's the caste, which is specifically their job is to destroy things. But again, all throughout my life, even if I'm not at war with anyone, I am destroying things. And this is the point that I was making um, that I think um, the person objected to the most is that well, I have to destroy other uh, other animals in order to eat them, or I have to destroy plants uh, in order to eat them. I have to destroy the cells in my body because they there's nothing I can do about it. They're going to destroy themselves. They're going to give up the ghost anyhow. Or you know, if I you know. I, you know, scratch really hard. I got, you know, itch here. Oh, well, that kind of bunch of dead skin cells, you know, flake off there. So well, I just killed like, you know, maybe a million like uh, living cells there when I just scratch myself. So, um, oh, look out. Oh, I just stepped on a bug, you know. I mean, you, you can't help but destroy other living beings by existing in this world. It's just the nature of it. And that's one sense in which he's communicating here. That aspect of reality is the role, the, the sense in which we all experience the Dharma of a Kshatriya. If, however, you do not perform this religious duty of fighting, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duties and thus lose your reputation as a fighter. So what this is basically saying is that if you do avoid performing your duty and you can infer this beyond that to the other whatever other duties you have to do, that you don't actually make anything better. And this is getting back to the idea of ren renunciation uh, that, that is not to t be taken as a full literal renunciation of all of one's life um, and existence but rather, rather renunciation of the results of one's actions, or um, what Aleister Crowley liked to call uh, lust for results. Um, same ancient idea, but uh, Uncle Al put it in a nice contemporary occultish package, so you can ponder it from that direction um, if you find that more um, flavorable. But the idea is this, that by total abstain, abstinence and renunciation, really you just make things worse. And finally, on the question of yourself, well, he says, O son of Kunti, Either you will be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets, or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom. Therefore, get up with determination and fight. So, again, even for yourself, if you want to abstain from fighting with the world because you're afraid that you're going to die yourself, take courage in the fact that the real you cannot be destroyed. It cannot be destroyed by anything. Um, and you can take it as, in the platonic sense, you take that as it's 
the divine self is not material, so it can't be destroyed by material things, like the material body uh, can be destroyed or eventually degrade and fall apart on its own. But um, if you take all of this in a non-dualistic and totally materialist sense, which I do, and which I believe many of these ancient systems really were based on, and certainly um, Gurdjieff's system, is, is totally based on the idea that everything is material. What it means is just that a uh, lower level of materiality can't destroy this higher, finer level of materiality because they're of different, uh, different qualities. So there can be an effect with it, but they can't destroy um, each other. Um, and, and this also has to do with the different laws say like a higher level of materiality would be comprised of less laws. Let's say it's comprised of like, there's like 12, 12 laws and, and the realm of material reality is comprised of 48 laws. Well, it's like those 12 laws are still consistent within it. So they, they flow down and the lower level partakes of those 12 laws from above right? And then carries that through its 48 laws. And then the next level of 196 laws takes all those 48 plus another 48 uh, on top of that. So it's that consistency of the 12 and what is within that that goes on up to the absolute, um, which is the indestructible nature of it or quality of it. So you don't have to be a mathematician in order to grok these things, but um, what we try to gain through work, through the prolonged effort of awakening something new within us, is not just the mental understanding of these ideas, but the sense of it, and the feeling of it, and the knowing that there is something else within us that is able to survive through what perishes on the outside. We have um, a, a moment of self-remembering where you realize all the different roles you played throughout your life and that, and that all of them are essentially dead now and gone forever. Um, and that you have something within you has has remained consistent and continuous then you are one step closer to understanding what is meant by that sense of permanence that sense that there is something within you that cannot die and that helps fuel the courage to be able to let go of the known and have trust in something higher that can transform you. Thank everybody who gives you the question and thank everybody who gives you the opportunity for internal struggle. Stay true, go against the grain, and keep the dark fires burning.